Welcome to the InfoGov Hot Seat Vodcast, featuring candid interviews with practitioners, consultants, and solution providers on hot topics in the information governance industry. Here's your host, Jim Merrifield. Hello and welcome to the InfoGov Hot Seat. I'm your host, Jim Merrifield, and with me today is Trevor Bell at Zero. Welcome, Trevor. Hey, Jim. Thanks for uh, thanks for the invite today. Yeah, it's great to sit down with you for, for a few minutes on the hot seat. So why don't we kick it off and get a brief introduction of yourself, how long you've been with Zero, and uh, one fun fact about yourself. Don't forget the one fun fact, because I will ask you again to, to, to answer the question. So... Why don't you kick it off? Sure, thanks. Um, so yeah, my name is Trevor Bell. I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Zero Systems. Um, my job really is to ensure that the experience that our customers have with all of our AI applications is a delightful one. Um, I manage uh, the organization that relates to all of that, uh, all of those elements. So that's uh, my 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 organization is called the Customer Office, and it includes things like project management office, the implementation, um, well, technical account management, um, as well as uh, customer success and support. And really, as I say, that's all designed to make sure that the experience that the people have with Xero, um, all of our customers is um, an amazing one, and that the journey that they go through with us is um, not just about the software, but about the experience, and that it's something that kind of resonates over time with them as well. Um, I've been with the company for four and a half years. I was, uh, I started, I guess, just after their second AI application, which was their, uh, which was our desktop um, Athena compliance and governance tool. Um, the mobile compliance and governance tool was already in place. And then obviously over the four years that I've been here, we've, uh, we've very much expanded into different areas, different um, verticals. Um, Primarily started in legal. That's uh, our home base for sure. Some place that we're uh, very comfortable. We have a lot of experience there. But now we're in uh, outside of legal and into corporate and services and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I've been doing that for four years. Really enjoy it. It's been a great experience working with Zero. Um, seeing what challenges the customers have um, outside of what I used to do. So I was in corporate for 17 years doing business transformation there. And then I, I entered into legal about 10 years ago and I was doing document management. I was the director of consulting for uh, a company that implemented document management systems. And coming over to this side and, and using AI solutions to better the experience within law firms, it's been very rewarding for me, especially being in a, a startup sized organization like Xero. Um, I guess we're no longer really startup sized, but we were when I got there. Uh, and so, yeah, that's that's uh, that's that's what I do there. That's how long I've been there. And one fun fact about me is I am an acting captain in the fire service. I work for the municipality of Clarington up here in Canada. I've been doing that for four years. Um, lots of other opportunities to explore and expand your skills and experiences. Um, I'm a pump operator, acting captain, firefighter, tanker driver, lots of different roles. But ultimately, they do the same thing. Uh, my day job, I fight fires. My my night job, I fight fires. I love it. I love it. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Thanks. Well, thanks for giving us some insight into your life. And uh, you've been with Zero for quite a while, from the startup days to not so startup days now. You know, Zero is all over the place. I see it legal industry conferences and things. So um, yeah, it's nice to to get to know you a little better. And uh, so let's talk about AI. You know, the AI has been all over the place. You know, you go on LinkedIn, you read in the news, even if you're not in the legal space, when you mention AI, everybody, uh, it's on everybody's doorstep and everybody knows uh, what you're talking about. So I know your your product line is really focused on AI and it's really nothing new, right, uh, to zero. So can you walk us through uh, the process of developing your, your AI software and I guess maybe what are the key uh, drivers of that sure. maybe from a customer perspective yeah absolutely i'll start off by saying that uh you know this um ai hype cycle which i guess is on the down slope now was uh for me personally a really great thing um 
we, of course, as you said, Jim, we're already in the AI space. But I remember when I got uh, hired with Zero, I, I think our, our um, website was actually zeroapp.ai, like the end of our email addresses were all .ai. And people just were not necessarily ready for AI, even though it was you know there and it could offer a ton of value to them. Um, and I remember changing our name to Zero Systems because it resonated more about what we were doing, which was not just AI. It was also about the experience as well. Um, and then the hype cycle came along. And of course, now everybody was like, oh, I got to have AI. And here we are, you know, already been doing it for years. We've got some uh, AI products in the legal sector already used by thousands of people. And it was uh, it was nice to not have that discussion about AI, but instead about how AI could help them. Um, and that really has like largely formed our uh, approach to developing software. As you say, it's more from the customer experience. I'm not uh, I'm not the chief technology officer, so I don't sit in the engineering shop. But you know, we are all part of the development lifecycle of all of our AI apps. So from the employees in Zero to the employees or to the uh, customers that we interact with, they're all part of that lifecycle. And I think. That's the key element, that, a key differentiator in terms of how we develop our AI applications. We're really developing them to solve a problem, solve a specific problem. So we have our AI framework, our models, and then we develop AI applications on top of that. So when we're talking about developing a product, we're talking about solving a specific challenge for you know, a law firm or a corporation. Um, good example of that is uh, you know, people have challenges uh, governing and complying with the policies in their law firm about their um, correspondence and how do they file their correspondence into their digital matter files. And AI can absolutely help with that, right? There's so many cognitive micro decisions that go along with filing those emails. What matter are we talking about? Where should we file it? Um, if you've already made those decisions in the past or there's been similar decisions made in the past, why not allow AI to do that for you? So, yeah, the big component is making sure that um, we address the challenge that they have with AI versus what a lot of people do, a lot of other companies do, is AI can solve everything, right? And what and basically trying to sell them on the concept of AI versus the actual solution to a specific problem they have. I, I remember, I'll, I'll leave the company's name out of it, but I remember when I was working at the DMS shop, um, we, we got into selling this product that basically was a business process management tool and the sales pitch was we're basically going to give you a bunch of bolts and a couple of wrenches and uh, that's the value so good luck you can make any you can solve any problem that you need to solve with the with these bolts and this wrench um and i do we just don't think that that's the way to go about solving that problem we want to make sure that we understand clearly what what these uh law firms or these corporations are going through and that we address a specific use case with AI. Um, the other big thing for our development cycle is that it's very uh, you know, iterative in its approach. Um, I, I think of like traditional software development and deployment of software technology. It was generally a very long process. Like even some of the process, uh, products that we have in Xero, um, it was quite a life cycle for them, right? It took uh, you know a year to perfect. You were deploying the software, you were working with customers to refine it, you were going through hot fixes, point releases, and eventually you get to the product that everybody loves. With, uh, with generative AI and things like that, it's just a different world, right? You can sit with a client, understand their requirement. You already have the base models to address the thing that they have a challenge for. And you just need to make sure that you develop the front end for the human in the loop components to get through that. And that's another key component of our development life cycle is, is what, what we call POVs, um, proof of values. We don't really like to call them proofs of concept because the concepts are already proven. It's just the showcasing the value based on their specific use case so that when we develop a, an application on top of our AI engine for that specific use case, they come out of it happy because they don't have to invest until they know that the AI will do what it's designed to do or what we, we, we say it will do which is also something that's kind of tricky in the AI space right now. There's a lot of hype and a lot of people saying it can do anything, but uh, not so many have demonstrated how it actually does that thing. So it's nice to be able to do a POV, a quick POV and show them how that works um, and go from there. So 
yeah, that, those are um, kind of our core tenets of, of developing AI. And, and traditionally as well, all of our apps have a human in the loop component. And um, there's a couple of core reasons why you do that. Um, not all of our apps require human in the loop, but they all do have space for human in the loop as well. So making sure that you have that allowance for people to be involved in that AI process is also something that's a core tenant of our, our development cycles. Well, very good. I mean, you mentioned use cases. I know one of them, you know, email, email management, I think, um, you know, no matter what company you are, a law firm or a corporation, I think um, generally everybody struggles with email management, filing emails and that sort of thing. Um, and AI can definitely help with that. Um, but what are some other use cases that you're seeing, like, say, information governance professionals, maybe not specific to a law firm, but maybe even corporation? How are they using your AI technologies to, like, what are some of those use cases? Sure. Um, in, in the corporate space right now, there's a lot of um, manual processes going into um, digesting content within documents and making the right decisions based on the based on the values that are in that in that document. So really, AI is capable of doing all of that manual effort of extracting those entities from those documents for you and presenting them in such a way that you do not have to be the one involved uh, in extracting them, just using your cognitive abilities to make sense of it. Um, in the case of RAI, we have uh, one of our uh, outside of legal models right now, but definitely has, uh, um, you know, utility in the legal space uh, is smart entity extraction. So, you know, in this case, uh, there's a large Fortune 500 uh, corporation. Um, they wanted to extract uh, entities from specific documents that they get in. And what we do is we ingest all of that, all of those documents and pr produce on a human in the loop interface, those values that were extracted with a weighting. And so essentially what they can do is just validate our AI results or if, if necessary, adjust the AI results. And that in essence makes the AI smarter and next set of documents that have extractions from them, they get that value from that human in the loop exposure. And so ultimately in this case, um, we're, we're talking about a financial uh, company and um, they're extracting uh, capital calls and things like that, distributions and the entities from those, and those are then um, pushed into their finance system. So AI has actually been implemented to remove that, um, just the manual drag of getting the content out, but the human is still infinitely valuable there in validating the results and assisting with the learning of the technology. Um, of course, in the legal sector, we do have, as you say, the compliance and governance around uh, uh, correspondence, um, but also a couple other key elements that we have is uh, we have um, time capture as well. Um, time management, it's basically you can utilize AI to assist you in um, capturing the, the time spent working on specific items, but furthermore, adding that cognitive element to it, which is what was this thing associated to? Who was the client? What was the matter? Um, how much time did we work on it? And what was it that you're doing? Let us generate an AI driven narrative for you so that specifically those elements that would normally take up your time from a micro decision perspective, those decisions are made on your behalf. And so basically not only are you getting the time captured, which seems nice, but also you're more compliant with the with the the policies that are in place to govern your law firm. You know, if you can't have vague narratives because nine times out of ten they get rejected on billing, it's better to uh, you know have defensible narratives generated on your behalf. And then the lawyer always has the, as I mentioned earlier about the human in the loop, the lawyer always has the luxury of uh, modifying those uh, entries um, and and helping the time entry the time capture system, which we call Apollo. Um, become more intelligent as well. And another example I'll give you um, is, um, we call it policy enforcement. And this this one is actually resonates across industries. So it's in legal, it's got a really good use case in legal, but also a good use case in corporate. Um, and that is the extraction of specific rules or um, contractual obligations from documents. In the case of 
legal sector, it's primarily OCGs, outside counsel guidelines, um, and internal rules that maybe have been put in place to support the billing process. And AI basically extracts that from the OCG. It layers the historical content in that decision-making process as well. And it produces an output that allows uh, either a billing department or a billing attorney to review pre-bills with weighted um, compliance uh, and governance violations. So you can the, the lawyer can now not just look at a pre-bill and have to figure out everything, but just look at the things that are in violation of OCGs or historical events that cause those uh, to be um, rejected. And the same goes for corporations, right? They've got tons of contracts with different rules, rules that change, one rule that changes in a contract, a revision to a contract, and how do you keep keep track of all that stuff? Right now they do it manually and um, policy enforcer can actually review that content for you and, and present it back to you. So a couple of big use cases that are out there. Um, that's just scratching the surface on the use cases that we cover with our models, but we could talk for hours on that alone. Yeah, no, excellent. There's uh, tons of benefits. I mean, you just kind of laid them out there. And, and again, I think that was just a few of them. Let's spend a little time talking about the risks because that's also hit headlines too. Uh, the risk of using AI, there's a lot of ethical concerns in the marketplace with data privacy, data bias, as you were, in mm -hmm. software development. Um, are there any areas there that uh, have kind of presented some challenges to a software company like yourself? The questions yeah, but, you've been getting from clients and yeah, things? Absolutely. Definitely the data, um, data privacy. Uh, that's a big one. Um, but so is, you know, algorithm bias, of course. Uh, and we designed our we design our AI applications with those elements in mind. Every one of them, right from our right from the base models, um, as it relates to data privacy, especially in the legal sector, right? D data privacy is important to everyone. Uh, there's no corporation, services organization, law firm. It doesn't matter. You and me. Uh, all of our data is important, and all of our data is, should be uh, treated with the utmost respect. Um, and that was one of the challenges I, not just me, but everyone, I think in the industry saw with open source platforms like ChatGPT, which, you know, obviously revolutionized a lot of things, but ultimately all of the data is there out in the open, right? So with Zero, what we did is we created our own large language models based on some com components of those uh, LLMs that are out there. Um, but all of the LLMs that we have are ours. There, there are models that are in our environment. Um, they are first tuned on our data and um, uh, they are then provided to the law firm uh, or the, the company. And the data that are in those models, they never leave their secure parameter. So it's not like with, with our AI applications, it's not like your data is going out to the ether to be analyzed and compared against a multitude of other people's information, which then ultimately can create a lot of hallucinations. And when we're sitting in the in any uh, industry, you, you don't want your data to produce results. Like I, I know uh, our CEO often says this. He says, "If you ask ChatGPT a question, what do you get? You'll get an answer. 100% of the time, you'll get an answer. But is that answer correct? That's where the hallucinations come in, right? So if you're trained on in the case of the legal industry, as an example, if you're trained on legal data um, or you're trained on finance data, then you go and you put those models into a, a law firm in this example, and they train it further with their data, you don't get hallucinations because it's trained on your data, right? So this is the primary way in which we've addressed the data privacy. And that is, we just won't take your data. We just won't touch your data. Your data will always be in your environment under your control your supervision and it never has to leave your, your your environment. And we set up rules that allow the training to improve based on human in the loop, which then helps to address the algorithm bias, right? So if you have human in the loop, somebody validating the results of the AI, bias is less likely because they can look at it and say, that's not right and change it. So with that human in the loop aspect, you essentially uh, further refine the results of your trainings. And I think that's that's a, that's a, I've said it a couple of times, right? That human in the loop is a core component of us. We don't think that our product is designed to, you know, eliminate the need for people. People will always be there, um, and so long as you make space for the right 
um, skills to be applied in a process, then human in the loop is going to add a ton of value to, to the AI. So yeah, those are a couple of things. Yeah, I like that term, human in the loop. I like it. Yeah. yeah so we're not so we're not going to see like another uh, chapter of Terminator or something where machines uh, take over the, the world. You know, it, it's, with you know it's, I, I hear you. It's impossible not to imagine that scenario, right? I went to this uh, conference in Canada called the Collision Conference, and uh, very cool conference. It was uh, you know very well put together. Uh, and they, but the track that, you know, was right in the middle of the hype cycle. So the, the, the track for AI was crazy, right? It was like 90% of the conference was AI. And of the 90%, uh, 80% of them were doomsday people about, you know, <laughs> um, AI taking over the world. And, you know, we're not, we're not there. And I think if companies like Zero and all companies who are invested in developing uh, AI applications and using AI to better the human experience. Um, so long as they all do it, we all do it ethically with the people in mind, I think we're going to be golden and I don't think we'll have to worry about Skynet anytime soon. Um, and as the chief customer officer, you know, people are my thing. That's, that's what's most important to me is the people and what they're going through and what they worry about. Um, not so much about whether AI can do a, you know, a million micro decisions. That's more for our CTO to consider. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about the people a little bit. Um, I know you've mentioned a lot of benefits, how you've been able to get ahead of the risks. Is there one success story, uh, maybe a short one, that uh, you went into a client and you know don't name any names unless you know they're on your site or something, but um, you know you were able to kind of go into that client, saw an issue, and were able to apply AI technology to the problem and now that that customer is in a better position sure yeah absolutely and, and there's lots of examples and you know um they're mostly willing to be named you know so in the legal sector everybody's kind of very protective of their firm names which is fine and i respect that but uh, a couple of them have been working with us so long and one of the things i'm very proud of working at zero is um we very much put people first and we build relationships that are meaningful and deep with our customers. Um, and so through, through the engagement life cycle and even after the product has been deployed and we're doing QBR reviews, there's always this level of camaraderie that is developed with the people we interact with. And, um, and most of them, you know, want to want people to know they're working with zero, of course. Um, so I guess, one, one comes to mind, uh, Winthrop Weinstein, they're, they're out of uh, a law firm in Minnesota. Um, they were one of the early adopters of our product, our, our compliance and our compliance and governance tool as it relates to filing. And they actually utilize both our mobile platform as well as our desktop platform. And the great part about that was that they had a challenge with, you know, getting digital content into their digital matter files. And they were looking for a solution that would be a carrot for their lawyers. Uh, you know, we always say no lawyer went to law school to file emails, right? They, they just didn't do that. It's not part of their job. They're, it's part of their job, sorry. It's not part of their job that they enjoy. Um, and given the fact that they're busy practicing law, it's sometimes a, a, a piece of their job that loses visibility. And so it doesn't get accomplished and, and um, a backlog can be created and that creates compliance and governance issues. You know, and they'll be the first to tell you that they know it's not good to have multiple emails sitting in places that nobody can get access to. Um, and so we came in with our product and uh, we came in with Athena, which is the desktop and mobile, as I mentioned. And we started, this was early, so we definitely had to go through a POC with them um, to prove that, to prove the concept, but also the value. Uh, and we did that and they purchased firm wide, rolled it out to everybody. And everybody's using that product now. And you can see in our quarterly business reviews when uh, one of the things that Zero also believes strongly in is transparency and visibility to how the applications that we make are being utilized. And so every quarter we go to the client, our clients and we demonstrate that to them um, through the use of metrics. And so we can highlight to Craig and team over there um, how their compliance is going, how things are improving, um, how much time they're saving and you can actually quantify that in real world values and yeah there is a case study out there on our website um, if you're interested if anyone 
watching this is interested in seeing that. Um, but the cool part about that is, you know, Craig, Craig and his team, like I said before, our customer relationships, they're, they're really like family to us now, right? We get a lot of, uh, you know, um, exposure to their team, their legal group, and on top of the product that we worked with them on that came from zero being a success, we also have been able to improve our product through access to their users through the relationships that we have. And of course, it doesn't hurt that the technology works as advertised and does the thing that they need it to do. Um, so that's one big success story. Holland and Knight comes to mind as another um, law firm. They were very much an early adopter of ours. Um, they deployed our mobile platform firm-wide. And to watch the uptick in users embracing that technology and expanding the, the true mobility experience to their users is something that I'm really proud of. I've, I've loved working with that team there. Um, great group over there, and um, yeah, it's been a it's been a successful project because they were early adopters. They were also the ones that had to learn with us as we grew, and so can't thank them enough for that either. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's in the legal sector. Um, I think uh, keeping names out of it for now. There's a big Fortune 500 firm that we just released uh, or just launched uh, to production earlier this year. Our Artemis product, which is our smart entity extraction using our large language models. Um, that was a huge success. They, they, this, this firm, this company basically said, we were the best vendor that they had ever worked with. Now, if their name comes up, I might get other, them in trouble with other vendors, but um, mm -hmm. it's, it's very, um, I'm very proud of that. Uh, part, the majority of it was the technology in that case. We'd like to think the customer team had something to do with it, but the technology was just stellar. It came along as they wanted it. and. Uh, you know, it did what not only did what we said it would do, but also offered more than they probably thought. So, yeah, those are no, that's great. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, everybody, I feel like we could talk success, success stories all day long with you, Trevor, you know, and that's what people want to hear. Right. Success stories, uh, case studies. And I think it's pretty cool that you, know, you have some early adopter customers that are able to work with you hand in hand. Technology only gets better with time and experience, right? It's like anything else. So uh, that's awesome. So final question for you. Any last thoughts for our audience today before we let you go? Jeez, I, th I think uh, maybe thoughts for two portions of your audience, I suppose. For those listening in who are thinking about AI, it is a real thing. <laughs> it can solve your problems. And uh, not just Zero, but I'm sure a lot of vendors, but specifically Zero is uh, here to hear the specific um, challenges that you are facing. Uh, and help determine how our models can actually solve your real world problems. Um, but I think specifically, yeah, AI is a real thing. It sounds very hyped up, but it is, and it's it's out there. It's here to stay, and it's not as scary as it seems. You know, it, it really isn't, especially if the vendor you're working with does care about your, your data and your data privacy. Um, and for those uh, people who are listening in and thinking about or just starting to develop AI platforms, you, you can be very successful with AI. It, it is something that is extremely and, and almost infinitely helpful in all industries. And uh, it may seem tough at the start, but once you, once you nail the model and once you get the right customer feedback to help inform the interaction points with your models, um, you, could, you could change quite a few lives. So definitely stick with it. And uh, same for you. AI is real. <laughs> it's here to stay. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wise advice there. Can't wait to catch up with you. And, uh, you know, fast forward a few months later, maybe sometime in 2024, we can have a follow up conversation about uh, AI and the likes. And I just want to thank you so much uh, for spending some time with us, Trevor. Uh, I think this was a really nice conversation. And, um, you know, thank everyone for attending today's episode of the InfoGov Hot Seat. Um, please visit our website to view uh, our latest web episodes, um, Trevor's episode and, and many others. And if you'd like to be a guest on the InfoGov hot seat like Trevor here, please submit your information through our website. And uh, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Welcome to the InfoGov Hot Seat Vodcast. 
featuring candid interviews with practitioners, consultants, and solution providers on hot topics in the information governance industry. Here's your host, Jim Merrifield.